migraines to subarachnoid hemorrhages. Learning about headaches can just as easily give you one. This episode should ease the pain. Please enjoy. Hey future doctors, thanks for tuning in to Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Hashim Aslam, and I'm a third year medical student at Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine, OUWB, and I will be your host today. Let's start with a vignette. Since the death of her husband six weeks ago, a 75-year-old woman has been having constant, dull aching, generalized headaches she describes as an intense pain. She has a poor appetite and lost about 12 pounds in that same time period. She also has trouble sleeping, a slight fever, and morning stiffness. Her only medication is Lipitor for high cholesterol. The rest of her exam is unremarkable. So what do we think is going on? I'll give you a few moments to think. Bonus points if you can try to think of the next best step in treatment. So if you guess giant cell arteritis, that's correct. And there are several clues in her presentation that lead us to thinking that, such as her age being over 50, fever, weight loss, and fatigue. 90% of patients with GCA actually present with a nonspecific headache, and many often have jaw claudication, amaurosis fugax, and ischemic optic neuritis. On labs, we might see an elevated ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And to treat, high-dose systemic glucocorticoids are promptly administered even before the diagnosis is established, and then a temporal artery biopsy would show, yep, you guessed it, it would show vasculitis and a predominance of mononuclear cell infiltration or granulomatous inflammation, sometimes even multinucleated giant cells. In this episode, we will start off by looking at primary headaches, which are the most common types of headaches seen in a primary care setting and have the greatest prevalence in the general population, and then explore some warning signs of head pain and types of secondary headaches that tend to show up on boards. Headaches can be broken up into two gross categories. So the primary headaches, which include tension type, migraine, and cluster headaches, and secondary headaches, which can range from cerebral venous thrombosis, preeclampsia, vasculitic syndromes, subarachnoid hemorrhage, space occupying lesions, such as brain tumors and hydrocephalus, and even infections, like sinus infections and meningitis. These types of secondary headaches will be covered a little more in depth in future episodes. So starting off with primary headaches, let's look at another vignette. We have a male in his 20s who wakes up from his sleep with a knife-like headache, ipsilateral lacrimation, rhinorrhea, and a meiotic pupil. This should clue you in to cluster headache. Cluster headaches are unilateral and repetitive stab-like periorbital headaches that are associated with ipsilateral autonomic symptoms, circadian periodicity, which means they happen roughly around the same time each day, and severely debilitating pain lasting around 15 minutes to 3 hours. As a treat, you can treat prophylactically with calcium channel blockers like Rapamil, and one thing that the boards love for you to know is that for acute episodes, you give 100% oxygen therapy. The next type of primary headache are migraine headaches, which are unilateral, throbbing headaches that can last from 4 to 72 hours and are associated with prodromal features like aura or sounds. They tend to be moderate to severe in intensity, more common in females, and have multiple treatment options, the most common being an abortive regimen of which includes NSAIDs, followed by tryptans, and prophylactis with either propanolol, so beta blockers, Barpluric acid, various calcium channel blockers, antiepileptics like topiramate, or tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline. Side question Do you remember the mechanism of action of tryptans? So, tryptans are agonists or activators of serotonin receptors, specifically the serotonin 1B and 1D receptors in the trigeminal nerve and blood vessels in the brain. This agonist activity inhibits the release and delivery of vasoactive peptides that cause inflammation associated with headache disorders. An important side effect to be aware of 
is the development of coronary vasospasms. Because of this, these drugs are contraindicated in patients with a history of coronary artery disease or Prinz metal angina. Another important side effect to remember is serotonin syndrome, which is more common if tryptans are given with other serotonin modulating drugs. So be on the lookout for patients with a migraine who might also have a mental health diagnosis they're taking medication for. A pearl to be aware of is that estrogen-containing medications, such as combined oral contraceptives or OCPs, are generally not recommended for individuals who experience migraines with aura because of an increased risk of stroke, and a little tie-in with OB is that for people with migraines and aura who need contraception, providers often recommend alternatives like progestin-only pills, intrauterine devices or IEDs, and barrier methods to avoid these risks. Now this next type of headache is one many of us on the path to becoming physicians might have experienced, sometimes even more than once during our journey, and those are tension type headaches. These headaches typically present as bilateral, dull, band-like headaches that can last anywhere from 30 minutes to even a week at times, and the best treatment option is a combination of sleep and stress reduction, plus acetaminophen. The International Headache Society has defined different categories of tension headaches based on how frequently these headaches occur and how persistent they are. The first category are infrequent episodes of tension type headaches. These happen less than 12 times a year and each episode can last from 30 minutes to 7 days. Next are frequent episodes of tension type headaches. So these occur between 1 and 14 times a month and each episode, again, can last from half an hour to a week. And finally, we have chronic or persistent tension type headaches. These are defined by having episodes at least a couple hours and can be continuous in nature and happen at least 15 times a month on average. And at times, you might experience mild nausea. On an interesting note, a 2019 study in the Journal of Clinical Neuropharmacology found that patients with persistent tension type headaches refractory to acetaminophen therapy who received botulinum toxin A every three months, symptoms improved in 50 and 78% of those patients at 6 and 12 months respectively. Now let's say we have a 26-year-old female who presents with a chronic headache. The headache commonly begins in the morning and persists for most of the day. The headache occurs almost daily and she averages about 20 headaches a month. She reports that abortive therapy with zolmitriptan and acetaminophen are no longer effective. She has taken these medications approximately 15 to 20 times a month for the last four months. Her medical history is significant for migraine with aura. Physical exam is completely normal. We've talked a bit about different types of medications to help treat these primary headaches, but what if they keep on worsening? This could be pointing to a medication overuse headache, also known as a rebound headache. These rebound headaches are secondary headache disorders due to medication overuse in patients with a primary headache diagnosis. And this is typically a clinical diagnosis, so to be diagnosed with a medication overuse headache, you need headaches that occur greater than 15 times a month, medication use to treat those headaches about 10 to 15 times a month for more than 3 months, a history of a primary headache disorder, so migraine, tension type, or cluster headache disorder, and to treat this, the first line option is to discontinue the overuse headache medication and then provide bridge therapy. So bridge therapy gives some symptomatic relief while the patient is withdrawing from the offending agent. And typically, patients can bridge with steroids like prednisone, 40 to 60 milligrams per day, tapered over a week, dihydroergotamine, which narrows the blood vessels into the brain. This can be given at one milligram IV or IM intramuscular every eight hours for two to three days or different muscle relaxants like baclofen or tizanidine. And the ultimate goal of bridge therapy is to alleviate the immediate headache burden while allowing the patient to safely discontinue overuse medications and transition to long-term preventative strategies. So what are some headache warning signs physicians need to keep a lookout for that might point to a more serious secondary issue requiring urgent workup? These warning signs for a secondary headache caused by serious underlying etiology include factors like onset, so if the headache is new in nature, the patient never experienced headaches before, and all of a sudden they wake up one morning and they have a severe headache. Side lock headaches, so it's only side lock to one side of the face or a more specific portion. 
and then having thunderclap pain. Modifying factors, so the headache getting worse or better with Valsalva, laying down on positional changes, systemic or neurological signs and symptoms, an age greater than 50, and then a history of cancer, being pregnant or postpartum, so being in that hypercoagulable state, trauma, and then recent travel. And that might clue you in to infections like toxoplasmosis or meningitis infections. Let's look at our next case. We have a 52-year-old man who's brought to the ED by his roommate after being found confused and unsteady on his feet. His roommate reports that the patient, who has a long history of heavy alcohol use, fell and hit his head on the kitchen floor three weeks ago, but did not seek medical attention at that time. Since the fall, the patient has been increasingly forgetful, irritable, and has complained of a persistent dull headache that's worse in the morning and with coughing or straining. He's also noticed progressive weakness on the right side of his body over the past few days. On physical exam, the patient appears disheveled and has a strong odor of alcohol. He is disoriented to time and place. His vital signs are notable for mild hypertension and a heart rate of 92 beats per minute. The neurological exam reveals right-sided hemiparesis and a positive Babinski sign on the right. Pupils are equal and reactive, but the patient has mild dysarthria. So what is the most likely diagnosis, and what is the pathophysiological mechanism behind this condition? And bonus, how does chronic alcohol use contribute to the development of this condition? I'll give you a little bit to think this over. So the patient most likely has a chronic subdural hematoma. This condition occurs when blood accumulates between the dura mater and the arachnoid layer of the brain, typically due to tearing of the bridging veins following head trauma. The gradual accumulation of blood leads to increasing intracranial pressure, causing headache, neurological deficits, and cognitive changes observed in this patient. Alcohol causes brain atrophy, leading to increased space between the brain and skull, which makes the bridging veins more susceptible to tearing, even during minor trauma. Chronic alcoholics often have coagulopathies due to liver dysfunction, which can also lead to prolonged bleeding and hematoma formation. On top of this, alcohol also impairs coordination and balance, increasing the likelihood of falls and head injuries. A non-contrast head CT scan of the brain is the imaging modality of choice to confirm the diagnosis of a subdural hematoma, and typically these hematomas appear as crescent-shaped hyperdense areas on the CT scan, often along the convexity of the brain. Now chronically, the hematoma may appear hypodense or isodense compared to the brain parenchyma due to the breakdown of blood products over time. Let's say we have a patient that comes in, they complain of a thunderclap headache, worst headache of their life, ten out of ten pain, and extremely intense. What are some presentations that you might you think might cause these symptoms? But well, one that comes to my mind immediately is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now these are acute aneurysmal ruptures of blood into the CSF space. And they're often characterized by nausea and vomiting, meningismus, which is a clinical syndrome of a headache, neck and stiffness, photophobia, often alongside nausea and vomiting, cigarette smoking, which is the most important preventable risk factor, hypertension, and polycystic kidney disease. And a CT, CT head without contrast would show hyperdensities in the supercellular cisterns extending peripherally. And when a CT without contrast is normal, and there's still suspicion for a subarachnoid hemorrhage, then a lumbar puncture is done, which shows xanthochromia or red blood cells in the CSF. Another cause of this thunderclap headache can be a hypertensive emergency, which is seen with treatment-resistant hypertension. Treatment-resistant hypertension is defined as persistent blood pressure elevation despite an appropriate regimen of three or more antihypertensive agents of different classes, one of which is a diuretic. Pituitary apoplexy can also cause this, and this presents as an excruciating headache of acute onset, signs of hypopituitarism such as intense fatigue, irritability, hypoglycemia, low libido, and also visual symptoms. And this is a neurosurgical emergency. To treat, you need an urgent early transsphenoidal surgical decompression. And finally, a less common and more rare presentation, but one that still shows up on boards, is a third ventricle colloid cyst. These are benign, fluid-filled intracranial tumors, typically diagnosed incidentally in adults in their 30s and 40s. And if the cyst ruptures, it can lead to acute obstructive hydrocephalus, 
especially if it's near the foramen of Monroe. Let's do a quick neuroanatomy tie-in. Can you recall the path from CSF production to circulation? So CSF is produced by the lateral in the lateral ventricles by the epithelial cells lining those ventricles. It then goes from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle through the interventricular foramen of Monroe, the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct, also known as the aqueductus sylvius, and the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space, through the frame of Lushka, which is lateral, and the frame of Magendi, which is medial. And then finally, it's reabsorbed into circulation by the arachnoid granulations. And to treat these cysts, you could do a craniotomy or remove them endoscopically. Our next case. A 25-year-old female presents with a new onset generalized headache over the last two weeks. It's described as a constant dull ache that wakes her up from sleep and she's gained 30 pounds over the past six months. Otherwise, she's healthy. She's not on any medications except birth control pills and exam is normal except for bilateral papilledema. What might you be thinking? Well, if you were between IIH or idiopathic intracranial hypertension or cerebral venous thrombosis, then you're correct. Cerebral venous thrombosis is when a blood clot forms in the brain's venous sinuses. The clot keeps blood from draining out of the brain, and as a result, pressure builds up in the blood vessels. This can lead to swelling and hemorrhage in the brain. IIH is a condition where there is increased pressure around the brain without an obvious cause, such as a tumor or other abnormality seen on imaging, and it's often associated with nausea and vomiting and tinnitus. To differentiate the two, oftentimes you can perform an MR brain with MR venography. And the feared complication you're trying to avoid with both of these is that if the elevated pressure is not relieved, the sustained compression and ischemia can cause the nerve fibers to atrophy or die. This condition, known as optic atrophy, results in irreversible damage to the optic nerve leading to blindness. In our next case, we have a 45-year-old female who was involved in a car accident five days ago. Her car was rear-ended, leading to a whiplash injury. Since then, she's been having constant pain on the left side of her neck left eye and orbital area, described as a dull ache without any modifying factors. She is otherwise healthy and takes no medications. Her exam is normal, except for a left Horner syndrome. So this would be a carotid artery dissection. In a carotid artery dissection, it's caused by blood entering the tunica media through a tear in the tunica intima of the blood vessel and a common cause of stroke in young patients. And oftentimes, you see a combination of neck pain, unilateral headache, and possible TIA or transient ischemic attack. It's important to note that the pain can precede other symptoms by hours to days, so the headache comes about four days earlier than many of these other symptoms. And there's many risk factors that show up in question stems that can clue you into thinking about dissection, such as having a history of hypertension, migraine with aura, hyperhomocysteinemia, connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos, Marfan syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, fibromuscular dysplasia, and even cervical trauma. So be on the lookout for question stems in which there's chiropractic cervical manipulation. Our last vignette. We have a 40-year-old auto mechanic who presents for acute, severe, throbbing headache, dizziness, nausea, and confusion. He states his symptoms progressively worsened over the past six hours and he works at an auto shop in which others feel the same. Exam shows tachypnea, tachycardia, and pallor. Pulse ox reads 97%. What do we think is going on? So this is a classic presentation of carbon monoxide poisoning. And let's build up this diagnosis from the pathophysiology. Carbon monoxide binds the hemoglobin with an affinity approximately 240 times greater than oxygen, forming carboxyhemoglobin. This reduces the blood's oxygen carrying capacity and impairs oxygen delivery to tissues, leading to hypoxic injury. Carbon monoxide also binds to myoglobin and cytochrome oxidase in the electron transport chain, further disrupting cell respiration and contributing to symptoms like headache, dizziness, confusion, and potentially even more severe neurological impairments or death. So how would you go about treating this? 
Well, the first step would be to remove the patient from the source of the carbon monoxide. Then you want to give 100% oxygen therapy to displace the carbon monoxide from hemoglobin. This treatment decreases the half-life of carbon monoxide in most patients in about 4-5 to five hours. Second line is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. If there's neurological deficits, if there's a pregnant woman, a child, if the patient is elderly, or if there's significantly elevated carboxyhemoglobin levels. And remember, from a diagnostic standpoint, pulse oximetry will not be able to detect carbon monoxide poisoning since it cannot differentiate between oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin, but a follow-up on arterial blood gas will reveal very low blood oxygen content. So how does this all relate to patient managing, management, and what are some take-home points? Well, one of the first signs in working up the chief complaint of headache or head pain is determine if it's primary or secondary, and then the urgency of treatment required. And one thing that can really help with this is when patients keep a headache diary. So you can instruct patients that every time they have a headache to write down what they were doing beforehand, such as eating spicy food, being physically active, sleeping more or less than normal, if they had any associated nausea or vomiting, seeing bright spots, a sensation of ringing in the ears, and then other, other factors such as what made the pain go away, where the pain was, and its location. And this is a useful tool because in a study analyzing trigger factors in patients with episodic and constant headaches using the smartphone headache diary application, it was found that 46.5%, so almost half, of severe headaches had an identifiable and actionable trigger factor, the most common of which were stress, fatigue, sleep deprivation, hormonal, and weather changes. So this means that many times you might not even need medications to help treat the headache, but you just need to treat the lifestyle factors and remove the inciting cause. And to help with this again, when you're asking the patient questions about their headache, make sure to include things like the onset of the headache, timing, laterality, quality, associated symptoms and triggers, family history, and also medications. And then you should go on to optimizing abortive treatment and adding preventative medications if needed, and finally referring to a specialist and conceding considering procedures in refractory cases. So thank you for listening. Hopefully, you gained a little insight into one of the most common complaints you will encounter regardless of what field you pursue and even picked up a bit of practical advice to help your friends and family members out. If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe to our podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, visit our website at spoonfulsugar.org and post them under the link for this episode. Good luck with studying, and remember that if you ever have an SOS moment while studying, Spoonful of Sugar is always there to help the medicine go down.